Revelation 9, turn there. Boy, I've got a, I've got a neat story to tell you this morning. It'll be during the morning worship service in about an hour. And I'm saying that because I think there's a guy listening that I'm going to tell the story about. I told him I would this morning. And uh, so he goes to church somewhere else. So I didn't want to bother him and say, hey, you know, I'm going to talk about you this morning. So if he's at his church, then I'll just let that be. Uh, but he might be listening this morning. And so uh, I promised him about two or three times I was going to talk about him uh, this morning. And so during the morning sermon, I will. Uh, and it is, it is one of those God did it stories is what it is. You just stand back and you go, how in the world did that happen? Okay, a minute or two minutes either way and our paths wouldn't have crossed. No way. Okay, you'll, when you hear the story, you'll get what I'm talking about. So Revelation chapter 9, <clears throat> we are uh, getting down to the wire on the description of uh, these evil angels. Uh, some people call them, use the word demons. Uh, you won't find the word demon in the English Bible, the King James. Uh, you won't find the word demon in the Greek. You won't find it in the Hebrew. You will find it, I believe, in the Latin, uh, any, any Latin, whether it's the Catholic Latin Vulgate or uh, there was, if I, if I remember right, there was an earlier Latin language Bible and uh, that the Catholic Church didn't destroy. And I think the word uh, demon comes from Latin, and it basically means uh, like a devil is what it does. So people are used to using that term, and so I'm not necessarily against it. It's, I mean, I'll say the word rapture, but you won't find the word rapture in the Bible. So some people say, oh, you won't find it in the Bible, so it doesn't exist. Well, it does. It's just called being caught up, or it's the resurrection, uh, or whatever, or the glorious appearing, and we can call it by different names, but that's what it is. And um, so we have this uh, demon army. The Bible calls them uh, evil angels. The Bible calls them gods with a little g. The Bible calls them devils. Uh, believe it or not, the Bible calls them God's mighty army. That's, you find that in Joel, his mighty army. And they're his not because they're on God's side and they're the righteous judging angels, but they're His because God made them to do exactly what they're coming out to do. They're going to they're do it. God designed them. God created them. God made them to do exactly what He's... Why, if, if God didn't want them to do this, why would He give that star the key to unlock the pit? He wouldn't. God would say, you're not, get, you're not getting this. I know what you're going to do with it. You're going to let them devils out of there. I, I don't want them out. So they're staying down there. No, God handed it over. Whoever that star was, it came down and God, God released them. Uh, but if you just look at the whole story of the Bible, God uses the devil to uh, perform his uh, his will upon this world, his way, um, his plan for this world, I should say. When Jesus chose Judas Iscariot, uh, was Judas this mighty righteous person that Jesus just loved and admired and think, boy, this guy, I'll add him to my disciples and we'll have us something. Boy, we'll just really get it going. No, he chose him because he knew he was going to betray him. He knew what kind of scoundrel he was. He knew what kind of rat he was. And the Bible says that. Why did God uh, raise up Pharaoh? Paul says it specifically to show forth the power of God. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart at the right times? Why is it that Pharaoh said at one time, okay, I'm going to let him go. And then the Bible says God hardened his heart. And Pharaoh said, no, nope, they're not going anywhere. And after the, even after they left, you read Exodus 14. The Bible specifically says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And Pharaoh said, uh-uh. We're going to go get him. And so he got his chariots up and went after him. Now, God held him back until the exact right time that he knew the Jews were going to be out of the Red Sea and he knew that Pharaoh would chase them in there. He used Israel as bait. Come on. 
Come on, come on after us. And he used them, and, and here comes Pharaoh and his chariots right there in the middle of the Red Sea, thinking we're going to get them now, and boom, God got them. And he had that all planned out. He had it all worked out. God knew exactly. So God knows exactly what this is. And he's releasing these devils out into the world. And Revelation 9, verse 10 says, They had tails like an scorpions, and their stings, uh, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. You know, I don't have that in my notes anywhere. I may probably need to look at that. But let's look very quickly. Uh, let's get an idea just briefly of the stings. I don't have that in my notes either, but I have it in my head and in my heart. So turn to 1 Corinthians uh, 15, if you would. And if you wouldn't, just listen then. How's that? Miss out. You could be making notes in your Bible. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 deals with uh, the gospel. It deals with Christ and his plan for the world. His plan is to conquer all of his enemies. Uh, verse 25 says, He must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And even if you look in the book of Revelation, the very last thing to be cast into the lake of fire is death. Death is thrown in even after the devil and the false prophet and the beast are thrown are cast into the lake of fire. So it, the, this is right. It's a double witness. Um, and then in verse, uh, uh, let's see here, verse um, 36 and 37, he gets into uh, what the resurrection is like unto God didn't design the resurrection after the seed. He designed the seed after the resurrection and uh, put it on this earth to show us a clear example of, of what it would, is going to be like. And then in verse 50 and 51, he begins teaching about the, the mystery, which is the translation or being caught up or the rapture. Hold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So in this, in this context here, we see that there is going to be a group of people on this earth at the time of Christ appearing in the air, who will escape death. They're not going to die. And we have examples of that. We have Enoch, who uh, was not, for God took him, the Bible says. And in Hebrews 11, it tells us that Enoch was translated from this world to heaven without seeing death. And uh, because he pleased God. In the next verse, it says, how do you please God? It is impossible to please God without faith. You've got to have faith. And Enoch had faith. And then we have Elijah, who was taken. The Bible even tells us what means he was taken up. It says, a big chariot came down from heaven. A horse and a chariot came down from heaven. They are God's angelic chariots. Came down from heaven, picked up Elijah, and uh, God separated Elijah from Elisha. And Elisha now, is good. he knows he's going to get his double blessing because that's exactly what Elijah said. He said, if you see me go, you'll get it. And so sure enough, Elisha was standing there. Elijah gets in the chariot and zoom, there they go into heaven. Quicker than the eye can see. So how does the Bible term it? In the, blink, in the twinkling of an eye, in verse uh, 52 here, uh, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, boom, just blink and people's gone. Just like that. And I think the world's going to see that. I think the world is going to know it when it happens. Now, he talks about death. And he talks about why the necessity of what he's going to do in, in verse 51, in translating the dead into heaven and then taking those who are not dead and have not died alive. They will not see death, but they'll be translated. He says in verse 54, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption... And this mortal shall have put on immortality. And the idea there is like, it's like a garment. And that's what you see in Revelation 19. You see the bride of Christ, it was given to her to be adorned in fine linen, white and clean. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Not the righteous deeds, not the righteous acts, not the righteous doings, not the good works, not the money, nothing. It, is, it was the righteousness of Christ that she was allowed to be adorned in. The Bible's very clear on that issue. Shall I put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then he says in verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? Boom. O grave, 
Where is thy victory? And then he says in verse 56, the sting of death is sin. So when we look back here at this verse, they had stings in their tails. The Bible's telling you by way of here a little and there a little and none shall want her mate. In other words, two verses that draw you or, or bring you to a conclusion of why God sends scorpions and why they have stings on their tails. The sting is the sting of death. And the, the sting is because of their sin. Okay, the, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. So it's because God gave the law to mankind and mankind decided he didn't, didn't want to keep it, not going to keep it, not going to do what God said. And boy, we live in a world full of that. Amen? We live in a world full of people. We live in a world full of church people not doing what God said and don't want to do what God said and don't care about what God said. Uh, what they want is the, the uh, cookies and ice cream after the meal, but they don't want the meal to go with it. They don't want nothing else. God, just give me a nice life and take me to heaven. That's all I care about. Uh, but God says, no, nah, I got, you got, you got, there's a way you got to, you got to be, and you got to let me, you got to let, let me rebirth you. And they don't want that. They don't want a new creation. I was going to preach on that this morning. God kind of changed my heart and my mind a little bit. But anyway, uh, so that's, that's the basis of the sting and, and what it represents. And it's interesting because uh, back in 1 Corinthians 15, oh, death, where is thy sting? The sting of death is sin. So we notice here that the sting, when people are stung, they don't actually die. No one, and we, it, we go back to uh, verse, I have to be careful with this, my Bible, it's ripped in half here. Um, verse 5, to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months. So for five months, no one dies, which is not normal. Thousands of people die every day around the world. People die all the time, every second, somebody's dying. Bunches of people are dying. I don't know the exact numbers. I don't know the, the statistics on it, but you got to know that with seven point some odd billion people in the world, and it'll be eight billion in about five or six years, that with that many people in the world, you're going to have people that are dying constantly. And that's what we have. But in this case, and I have a, th a theory on it, but I'm not comfortable with sharing it, because um, I just don't know if it's right. I don't even know if it's close, and so I just don't like, I just don't like to guess, I, I suppose, uh, and mislead somebody. But there is a reason why God is not allowing people to die. Uh, and maybe it's just the sheer fact that God's torturing them for five months. That would be reason enough. Um, but I think there's probably another reason why nobody's going to die for five months. And then, and so if you take that now and apply it to what we're seeing as far as medical technology in this world right now, you have companies all over the world that are, that are doing research into altering the human genome, altering our DNA, which is the Bible describes in Psalm 139 as a book that God wrote that has all of our members written in it. And if God wrote that I'm supposed to have five fingers, then I have five fingers. And I could have my DNA altered, I suppose, to where I could grow another finger. Okay? I don't want it. Giants had it. I don't want it. Um, but I don't want it for the mere fact that God designed me to have five and two eyes and thinning hair. Brother George, I remember the first time we had Matthew and Caleb out to a theme park one time. And uh, we walked around all day and I didn't wear a hat. And the next day I got up and I was combing my hair and my head was sore. I went, ow, like it was bruised. You know, like I'd bumped my head on the headboard at night or something like that. And what in the world is wrong with my head? And a couple days later it started peeling. I went, oh, no. Huh? Yeah, no, it was sheets. 
dangling in the wind. And I'm going, oh no, my hair's too thin. So I wear a hat now. Uh, but anyway, the, the technology of trying to prevent death. Men are striving for it. And it goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. Where the devil said, ye shall not surely die. So what is, what is the sting of death? It's sin. Where did sin begin? It began with a false promise that the devil made to Eve. Is that you can go ahead and disobey God, but you won't die for it. So the world now believes deep in their heart. They may not admit, they may, they may say, I don't even believe in God. But down in the deep recesses of their heart, they actually believe that they can sin all they want to, disobey God's commandments, and cheat. Now we're living in an age where they think they can cheat death. And we're close. Mankind is close. I don't know how close. Uh, I don't know exactly. There's probably things going on that we will never be made aware of. Uh, but that is going on. So it, it looks like a case to me where God's going to give man exactly what he wants. Oh, you don't want to die? Good. I'm going to let you live for the next five months. Nobody's going to die. And I'm going to, I'm going to sting you with this. And you will pray every day for death. You will be thrilled to die. But I'm not going to let you die. Um, he mentioned they were scorpions. Let me get into that. Deuteronomy chapter 8. God mentions that uh, he's talking through Moses. And um, Moses is referring to God here. Uh, that how he led Israel through the promised land. Or through the wilderness into the promised land. And he says in verse 15, who led thee through the, that great and terrible wilderness. Um, that wilderness was no kind place to be. And truly, if God had not watered the Israelites with the rock that followed them, and truly had God not fed them with manna from heaven, uh, they would have surely died. In fact, that's what they said. That's what they complained about. They said, here you let us out here in the middle of the desert and there's no water. So how you just let us out here to die. We could have died in Egypt. Uh, God gave them water. God gave them water every day. They didn't lack for water after that for 40 years. The Bible says that even the, the sandals on their feet, the, shoe, the shoes on their feet, uh, did not fade away. They, were, they, were, they bought brand new Nikes before they left Egypt from the Egyptians. And uh, they were still brand new when they got to the promised land. Sold it to the Canaanites, brand new Nikes, and the Jewish eBay. But anyway, yeah. You know, when I, was, when I was younger, my mother had a reputation. I could go to churches, and people would say, Oh, you're Crazy Judy's boy. Crazy Judy. And I'm going, Oh, my goodness. They know my mother. So now... It's crazy, Mike. I've been, I've been cutting up all week long at camp with these kids. I have. I've, been, I've had them in stitches all week. So anyway. Um, but anyway, they, they, led, they were led through that great and terrible wilderness. That wilderness struck terror in them is what, is what it means by that. It's huge, and it was full of terror, and they were led through that. And he says, wherein were fiery serpents. Now, we know that for a fact. We go back to Numbers, uh, what is it, 21, where they rebelled, uh, they, or they, they murmured, complained against Moses and against God because of the manna, and God sent fiery serpents. These were not, and I've heard some preachers say these were snakes that when they bit somebody, the sting was like fire. No, that's not what they were. The word here is seraph, which is the Hebrew word for fire. And in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah saw the seraphim because God said that he made his spirits a flaming fire. That's, what, that's their substance. That's what they're made of. They're made of light, in other words. They're made of fire. And in this case, these were not regular serpents. And no matter what medicines, no matter what uh, snake bite kits they might have had or whatever to draw poison out of somebody... They were not going to work. If you got bit, you were going to die. And what this is a type of is a type of the devil 
feeding us and biting us with his lies and we believe them all of our life and we live in sin but the truth of it is because we sin we're going to die we were poisoned and we're going to die so i bet my laptop is running out of juice right this minute oh no i may have to do this by remote or something like that or plug it in or something i don't want to lose it I may have to get my tablet out for the morning sermon this morning. There we go. But anyway, uh, they were fiery serpents. The Bible mentions in another place they were fiery flying serpents. So that tells you that they were not just regular snakes on the ground. They were spirits. And so the, the, if it's a spiritual poison, then only a spiritual uh, only a spiritual medicine can heal it. So that's why God had Moses make a brazen serpent. Brass is a symbol of fire in the Bible. A brazen serpent on a brazen pole and set it up there. And God said, whoever looks upon it shall live. And the, the spiritual medicine there is faith. Do you believe what God said? Do you believe that God, who sets this thing up and says, all you got to do is look at it. And to us, it doesn't make sense. But if we just, it's like Naaman, who he's, you know, he's told to go dip in the River Jordan seven times. And he says, well, that doesn't make sense. There's much cleaner. I don't know if you've seen the River Jordan or not, but it's not crystal clear water. It's like the Joachim up here. Okay, it's just a muddy catfish river. That's all it is. And Naaman's like, why, do, why, why don't, there's much better rivers back, I think it was from Syria. And, uh, and his servant said, you know, if he'd have told you to do some big thing, you would have done it. So why don't you just go do what he said and try it? Sure enough, he dips and he does it because he's got just a little bit of faith that God can heal him. And, he, and God healed him. And uh, so anyway, um, the fiery serpents and scorpions. So my guess is, educated guess is that they dealt with number one physical serpents and scorpions there's no doubt about that uh, but that they also dealt with these devils as well uh, the sting of death is sin and drought where there was no water uh, the bible even describes uh, a famine of not of bread not of water but of hearing the words of god that is a spiritual famine it's a famine that is meant to destroy the soul not just the flesh, uh, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint. I like that. The Bible even describes what kind of stone it was. It, was, it, was a, it, it belonged to Fred, a guy named Fred. It was a flint stone. Read your Bible. That's pretty good, wasn't it? I'm telling you. I'm wound up today. Ezekiel chapter 2, turn there. Get back on the drums there, Dave. Be ready. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 6. Um, this, uh, and I preached on this here a couple weeks ago. Ezekiel's calling to preach to his own people. And uh, God's telling him, Thou son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words. Um, and I tell you what, words can scare us. Somebody telling you bad news or something like that, that can scare you. Be not afraid of their words, threatening words. Be not afraid of that. Though briars and thorns be with thee. Now, there, again, there are physical briars and thorns, and there are spiritual ones. So how do you get that, Pastor Mike? Well, in 2 Corinthians 12, Paul said that because of the abundance of revelations, there was given unto him a thorn in the flesh, and then he describes it, what, it, what it is. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. It was an angel. It was an evil, mean, devil angel. That's what it was. A messenger of Satan to buffet him. He had a devil that just beat him up all the time. And, but what it, what it did was keep him humble. And when he asked God three times, take it away, God said, I'll give you grace. How's that? I'll give you grace. I'll let you endure it, and I'll help you through it. 
That way you can help other people. Okay? Remember, that, remember I said that. Because you're going to hear it again this morning. Though briars and thorns be with you. So there are spiritual briars and thorns. And um, devils that God will allow to be around us um, to keep us prayerful, to keep us in the word, to keep us on our knees, to keep us humble, keep us from being arrogant, keep us from being full of sin. Though briars and thorns be with thee. Uh, the Bible says that God put a hedge of thorns around King Manasseh for all those evil things that he did in the temple of God, even putting a, an image in the temple of God. God set a, a hedge of thorns about him, and I believe that they were evil angels that were just tearing him apart, and what it did was it caused him to repent. Those thorns caused King Manasseh, as evil as he was from a child, it caused him to repent. Uh, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Again, I think these are devils. They're, he's not just describing people in a, uh, you know, with colorful metaphors. He's not calling them bad names or anything like that. I think he literally dwelt among evil angels like scorpions. And God said, be not afraid. Not of their sting, of their words. Be not afraid of their words. Nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house. Open thy mouth and eat that I give thee. And um, our responsibility in this day and age right now is to take in as much, I believe, as much of the Word of God as we can. I know everybody's different, and not everybody can retain things that they read and so on, so just keep reading, okay? If you, if you can't hold water, keep drinking, all right? And, um, but just keep near the Word of God, stick to the Word of God, stick to your prayers, uh, stick to Bible fellowship, which I believe in, um, and don't be rebellious like this world is. We are dwelling, I believe, in the midst of scorpions and thorns all around us, everywhere we go. Um, you've heard me say this is not Mayberry anymore. This is not the world that is created in our minds of the good old days when everybody had good things and people made good pies and there were good times all the time and they had revivals that lasted two or three weeks and we don't live in those days anymore, and they're not coming back. But I do believe God has better days ahead of us than was ever, ever behind us. I believe that. So keep going forward. Amen? Keep going forward. Don't go backward. Um, Luke 10. Verse 17. Yeah, here we go. And the 70 returned again with joy, uh, saying, Lord, listen to this. Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Isn't that something? Even the devils are. And uh, that's power. God put his power on those 70 witnesses that went out by twos and they went and they knocked doors and they invited people to hear the gospel and if people wouldn't hear it and sent them out he said if the city does that then you kick the dust of your feet off your shoes and keep on walking go to the next one and God will get them in the judgment don't worry about it um, but anyway the 70 returned again with joy saying even the devils are subject unto us through thy name and he said unto them, look at this, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? I saw, and the fifth angel sounded, and I saw, saw a star fall from heaven. Same exact words. So look at the context that this is in. 
They had the devil subject to them, so they had devils everywhere after them. And he said, verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now, if that's power in the flesh, God did not give that to me. I see a snake, I run. They had, uh, they had a, the theme this week at camp was something about God's creation. And so they brought in some guys from the Creation Museum in Branson. And they brought some guys uh, that, uh, I don't know where they were from, but they said they were going to be bringing snakes with them, live ones. After, after lunch, for the afternoon deal, they were going to have everybody meet in the, in the uh, chapel there, and they were going to have snakes. So I ate, and went to the trailer, and slept. Went to bed. Didn't want, I don't want nothing, I don't like them. Uh, <laughs> uh, years ago, I preached against them, and somebody said, man, I like snakes. I got one. I got big old snakes. Well... You can have one, I guess, but just don't invite me over, okay? <laughs> I mean, I just don't like them. Um, but anyway, if that was in the flesh, I'm telling you, I, I don't have the power to tread on serpents. Um, they killed a rattlesnake at camp this year in one of the cabins, okay? Killed it. Um, and it should have been killed. It deserved it. Uh, rattlesnakes are bad. You don't want them around kids. Uh, I give you, uh, and you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. The, the churches in East Tennessee and Kentucky, they, they still, to this day, are snake handlers. They're of a Pentecostal type church, and they believe that God gives them supernatural power. And so what they're doing is they're tempting God. God said he would give them power to tread on them. He didn't say take them and dance with them and play with them, kiss them on the lips. He didn't say do that. There's been, there's been people, multitudes of people died from this. So where's their faith? Okay? And it's all big show. It's to show, look at what I've got. I've got power on me. I've got power on me. And I believe that's tempting God. I do. Um... Uh, tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power. They'll, some of them will drink poison too. And deliberately to say, I won't be killed. I can't be killed. God will not let me be killed. Well, you're tempting God. You're a fool is what you are. Over the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And I do see that as a big, big problem and issue, not just in Pentecostal churches, but all around church in general, is that we are rejoicing over the wrong things a lot of times. We're rejoicing about what Bible we use. We're rejoicing about the standards we have. We rejoice about and we, we brag about uh, how our church is like this and how our church isn't like everybody else's church, and we do that a lot. But Jesus said, rejoice not in those things. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. That's what you rejoice over. Rejoice that you're safe. Rejoice that you're not going to hell. Tell everybody. Don't tell everybody how good you are and how wonderful your church is. Tell them how rotten you are, how everybody in your church is just as rotten as you are, but we're all going to get to, get to go to heaven one of these days. Amen? Maybe we might start seeing some people saved. Reverse psychology, I say. Amen? Father, bless your word today. Thank you, Lord, for it. Lord, there's wonderful, wonderful things written in this book of life. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would instill them in our hearts, Lord, that we could wrap these things around our hearts and, and be ready, Lord, to face each and every day with them and reconstruct our lives and make it more like into your image, your glorious image, Lord, and not like our own or not like what we want people to see, but help everybody that we meet. God, I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for that. Help us, dear God, that everybody we meet we end up being a blessing to them. And we show forth the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives. Bless this word we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, wait till you hear the story.